supporting. Share the screen. There we go. All right, so today is uh, Thursday, July 29th, and we should be on Chapter 5, and we should actually finish Chapter 5, which I don't think we're going to do, and even begin Chapter 6. Uh, there is a lab tonight, uh, so we'll be discussing Lab 6. Any questions about any of that? Let me see... I think I've got chapter 5 already, but let me get chapter 6. Alright, if there's no questions, I'm going to begin. Uh, I did send out your unknown numbers last night. I think it was a minute after uh, midnight. So I didn't quite get it last night, I guess, but uh, I did get it to you. And uh, so you should have your unknown number and you're starting your project. And like I stated, what you're doing is you're just growing up the cells. Although you did streak it out for uh, the gelatin hydrolysis test. So that test has begun. And I'll get you the results to that in one week. That takes one week to incubate that test. That's why we did that one yesterday. Any question? Not yesterday, Tuesday. Any questions about any of that? So I think I said I sent it out last night. It was actually uh, one minute after midnight on Tuesday night. All right, if there's no questions, let's begin. see why I write to here in because I won't remember where we left off. <clears throat> so we talked about the different factors that can influence the activity of an enzyme. Any question about that? When an enzyme gets denatured, and this is true for any protein, what happens is, is that the enzyme changes its folding pattern and instead of being a nice normal shaped protein it comes into a different folding pattern and this we call a denatured protein uh, the best example of that is when you take egg whites out of an egg they're runny and they don't look white and they're kind of clear and then you put them in a pan and you fry them you fry them and then they become white, egg whites. And they're obviously not runny and they're not liquid. And what you did with the heat is just change the folding pattern of the protein, denaturing the protein. And that can happen with temperature when the protein is put at the wrong temperature. That can happen if you put the uh, protein at the wrong pH or in the wrong salinity. In fact, if you've never done it, take the egg white and put it into a strong salt solution and then mix it around. The egg whites, instead of being the clear egg whites, they will become white egg whites. I do not recommend you eat them, but uh, that's what they do turn into. Any question about any of that? When a protein is denatured and changes its folding pattern and the protein will take on a different shape. Uh, it may, it, it, it will lose its function. Uh, it certainly will lose its optimal function and the more it becomes denatured, the more of its function it will lose until it's lost all of its function. Any question about any of that? So there are different factors that can influence activity. If you take a look at the temperature of the enzyme activity, 
all enzymes will have an optimal temperature where they will work best. This enzyme, the optimal temperature is around 37 degrees, so this could be one of our internal enzymes. And then when you move away from 37, the enzyme loses its activity, and that's because the protein is slightly becoming denatured, and the further you move away from the optimum, the less functionality the protein will have. And then when you're way away from the optimal temperature, the uh, enzyme will have no activity. And that, of course, would be our enzymes if you uh, freeze them. And this enzyme is losing its activity around 10 degrees Celsius. That's about the uh, refrigeration temperatures. And then it's losing its activity at uh, 50 degrees C, which I don't know what that is. It's about halfway to boiling. And the same with the pH. All enzymes have an optimal pH where they will work best. This enzyme works best around pH 5. And when you move away from pH 5, the enzyme will have less activity. And then in extreme pHs, around pH 0 and pH 10, the enzyme will have no activity. Where do you think this enzyme might be if it has an optimal pH of around 5? Can anyone guess? Where do we have an enzyme that works best around pH 5? Come on. I know In the you intestines or stomach? Uh, no, your stomach actually gets down to a pH 1 or 2, so it's much more acidic than this one. So the enzymes that have optimal activity in your stomach, they will be working best around a pH 2. So this enzyme is not one that you see in your stomach. Your intestines are actually alkaline, so this enzyme is not going to be one that we'll find in our intestines. I don't remember the pH of the intestines, but it's around pH 8 or pH 9. Anyone else got a guess? Uh, your skin is around pH 5, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, sebum, which is produced by your skin, is slightly acidic, and then the normal microbiota that live on your skin metabolize the sebum and make it more acidic. So it lowers the pH to around pH 5. So this would be an enzyme that you might find on your skin. Or it could be an enzyme in a bacteria that's living on your skin although those cells might not be at pH 5 inside the cell, but outside the cell it would be. Uh, another factor that can influence enzyme activity is the substrate concentration. As you increase the substrate concentration, you increase the enzyme activity. And it initially climbs steeply but then it starts to slow. And then at this point here, when we increase the substrate concentration, we no longer get an increase in the amount of enzyme activity. Why might that be? Why is the curve flat right here? Does it get saturated? Yes. Uh, you have all of the enzyme already bound to the substrate at this point. And so if you increase the substrate concentration, you can't speed up the enzyme activity any further because all of the enzyme is already bound. Okay. Any question about any of that? Uh, another factor that can influence enzyme activity is inhibition. There are two types of inhibition. 
The first is competitive inhibition, where the inhibitor actively competes for the active site of the enzyme. And so if the active site is bound to the competitive inhibitor, then the substrate cannot come in. And that's why it's called competitive inhibition. There are some drugs that act as a competitive inhibitor of our enzymes. Any question about any of that? The second way that an inhibitor can influence the enzyme activity is a non-competitive inhibition, also called allosteric inhibition. This is where the inhibitor interacts with the enzyme with a site other than the active site. So the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme down here, and that changes the folding pattern of the enzyme. And when that happens, the active site is changed, and the active site can no longer bind to the uh, substrate. Any question about any of that? So that's non-competitive or allosteric inhibition, where the inhibitor binds to the enzyme and then that inhibits the enzyme by changing the folding pattern of the enzyme. And then the active site is in a different shape and it can't bind to the substrate. Feedback inhibition is where we have a metabolic pathway, which is an enzymatic pathway. And then we have one substrate converted by one enzyme, enzyme one, to intermediate A, and then an enzyme two, which takes intermediate A and makes intermediate B. And then enzyme three, oops, too far. Enzyme three, which takes intermediate B and converts it to an end product. So this is a, a metabolic pathway, and feedback inhibition is where the end product, See if I can get that in there. The end product, when it is high in number, will start binding to the first enzyme, acting as a uh, allosteric inhibitor, and that will shut down the first enzyme so that the substrate will not be made into intermediate A. If there's no intermediate A, you can't make intermediate B, and if there's no intermediate B, you can't make the end product. So this feedback inhibition, where the end product itself binds to the first enzyme, shutting down the enzymatic pathway, is a reaction or a feedback inhibition we frequently see in cells. Uh, why is this found? Well, if it's the end product that the cell is wanting to make, and once you get enough of it, you have the end product itself, shut down the first enzyme. Why shut down the first enzyme is because it's the most energy efficient. If you shut down the second enzyme, then the substrate will make the first intermediate, and that will cost the cell energy. So you want to shut down the first enzyme, and then the cell isn't spending any energy on a pathway it no longer needs because it has enough end product. And then when the end product in the cell decreases, there will be less end product to bind to the first enzyme. And so this enzyme can start working, making intermediate A, which will be made into intermediate B, which will be made into more end product. And the end product doesn't bind irreversibly with the first enzyme. It's a stoichiomic reaction, meaning it'll fall off every once in a while. But if there's lots of end product around, uh, one of the end products will bind to the enzyme and in, in, inhibit it. But if there aren't lots of end product around and it falls off, that enzyme will then act. Anyways, that's feedback inhibition. Any question about feedback inhibition?
there is another enzyme we need to talk about, and that is called a ribozyme, a non-protein enzyme. Most enzymes, probably over 95% of them, are proteins. But there are a few enzymes which are RNA, and we call those ribozymes. They are RNA, they cut some splices, RNA or other molecules, and they function as enzymes in that they have an active site that binds to the substrate. They're not used up or modified in the chemical reaction, so once they work, they can make the product and then go and bind to another substrate. Uh, Totora does not mention it, but we will talk about uh, ribosomes, which link amino acids together in the growing polypeptide chain. And I'm trying to remember, have we discussed that or not? I don't think we've talked about metabolism and aerobic respiration yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so we will talk about it. And in aerobic respiration, the ribosome does that. Well, that's the RNA part of the ribosome that does that, removes the amino acid from the tRNA, and then links it to the growing polypeptide chain. That is the only ribosome, ribozyme, that we will discuss in this class. Okay? Any questions about that? All right. So let's move on to metabolic diversity among organisms. All organisms, including microbes, require the following sources. They all require an energy source, and they all require a carbon source. We can categorize an organism based on its energy source. If the organism gets its energy from light, we call it a phototroph. If, on the other hand, the organism gets its energy from a chemical, either an inorganic or an organic chemical compound, we call them a chemotroph. And what are humans? Phototrophs or chemotrophs? Chemotrophs. Thank you. Um, yes, humans get their energy needs from the chemicals that they eat usually a food product like glucose. And even if it's another food item, we usually convert that, assuming you're a couch potato like me, we can usually convert that into glucose and then send it down aerobic respiration as glucose. But if you're a marathon runner, you can digest lipids directly by aerobic respiration but they don't do that until 45 minutes into their run. So even marathon runners initially do not directly burn lipids, at least initially. They have to be running for 45 minutes before they start burning uh, lipids. Ah, let's see, we can also categorize an organism based upon their carbon source. If the organism gets their carbon from CO2, then we call them an autotroph. And I think all of you know that green plants are autotrophs. They get their carbon from CO2 in the air, unless they're a water plant, in which case we can get CO2 in the water. But uh, you should know that there are bacteria, which can be autotrophs, and some of them are the photosynthetic bacteria. There are also heterotrophs, and these get their carbon source from an organic chemical source, such as glucose. And we are a heterotroph. We get our carbon source from an organic chemical compound like glucose. Any question about any of that? Now we can combine these four different trophs and then 
classify the organism based on the four, but it's a little more complicated. And if you get confused, always back it up and say, okay, where's the organism get its energy source? If it's from light, it's a phototroph. If it's from a chemical, a chemotroph. If they get their carbon source from CO2, they're an autotroph. If they get the carbon from an organic chemical carbon source, then there are heterotrophs. So always back it up if you get confused. When we combine them together, meaning put the energy and the carbon source together, we can classify an organism as a photoautotroph, a photoheterotroph, a chemoautotroph, or a chemoheterotroph. And we are a chemoheterotroph. Green plants are a photoautotroph. So let's look at these four in a little more detail. The photoautotrophs get their energy source from light. They get their carbon source from CO2. That's why they're a phototroph and an autotroph, and we call them photoautotrophs. Uh, there are two types. We'll talk just briefly about that. There are the oxygenic photoautotrophs, and they produce oxygen in photosynthesis. There's the anoxygenic, and they do not produce oxygen, and they are still photoautotrophs. Our green plants are a photoautotroph, and you should know that there are photosynthetic bacteria, like the cyanobacteria, which are photoautotrophs, and both of these are oxygenic photoautotrophs. We're going to skip these two and move to the second easiest one to discuss, the chemoheterotrophs. This should be familiar to you because humans are a chemoheterotroph. Uh, chemoheterotrophs get their energy source from a chemical, and that can be glucose or some molecule similar to glucose, and that's what we do. But there are chemoheterotrophs that can get their energy source from an inorganic chemical molecule, such as iron, or ammonia, or sulfate, or hydrogen sulfide gas, depending on the organism. Okay? Uh, all of the chemoheterotrophs get their carbon source from an organic chemical compound, such as glucose. And we get our organic our carbon source from molecules like glucose, and we get our energy source from molecules like glucose. Oftentimes, chemoheterotrophs have the same molecule being their energy source and their carbon source. But that isn't always required. For some of the chemosynthetic bacteria, they get their, that if they're chemoheterotrophs, they get their carbon source from a molecule like glucose but they can get their uh, energy source from another molecule, such as iron or ammonia. And we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, humans are that way, all animals, protozoa, fungi. Some bacteria, like E. coli, is a chemoheterotroph. The fermentative bacteria, like the ones that make yogurt, chemoheterotrophs. All right. But there are some chemosynthetic bacteria that are chemoheterotrophs, and they can get their energy needs from another molecule, not glucose, like ammonia or iron. Okay, any question about any of that? All right, now to throw a monkey's wrench in, chemoautotrophs get their energy source from a chemical, usually an organic or inorganic chemical like ammonia, iron, or hydrogen sulfide gas. And you're correct that these are some chemosynthetic bacteria. So the chemosynthetic bacteria are split. Some of them are chemoautotrophs, some of them are chemoheterotrophs. How do they differ? Where they're getting their carbon source. If it's a chemosynthetic bacteria and it's getting its carbon source from CO2, we call them a chemoautotroph. 
However, if they're chemosynthetic bacteria and they're getting their carbon source from an organic chemical compound like glucose, it is a chemosynthetic bacteria, but it is a chemoheterotroph because they're getting the carbon source from our organic chemical compound. I'll actually discuss one chemosynthetic bacteria that I know all of you are familiar with. And that is when you uh, lift the back of the toilet, the toilet tank, not the toilet bowl, but the toilet tank, you'll see yellow or brownish scum attached to the back of that toilet tank. That's from iron oxidizing bacteria in the water. And it's a chemosynthetic bacteria that's the chemoautotroph. It is getting its uh, energy source from iron and its carbon source from CO2. Okay, so there's a chemoautotroph that you've actually seen and you are familiar with it. You just probably never thought much about it. You just said, what's that scum in there? And it's uh, chemosynthetic bacteria largely getting its energy needs from iron dissolved in the water and how it gets its carbon is from CO2. Okay, any question about any of that? All right, remember the chemosynthetic bacteria can be split into chemoautotrophs and chemoheterotrophs. The hardest group for students to understand are the photoheterotrophs. They get their energy needs from light. That's why they're a phototroph. And they get their carbon source from an organic chemical compound, such as glucose. And that's why they're a heterotroph. Uh, the reason why you're not very familiar with the photoheterotrophs is because you're not familiar with them. As an example would be the green and the purple non-sulfur bacteria. They are photoheterotrophs. And I'm sure none of you have heard of the green and purple non-sulfur bacteria. If you took the prerequisite for this class and they discussed euglena, euglena can act as a photoheterotroph getting its energy needs from light. It is photosynthetic. And if you have sugar in the water, it can get its carbon source from glucose in the water. Okay? Any question about any of that? Now the complication is euglena can change its classification, depending on what's available. If there's only light and CO2, euglena will act as a photoautotroph. Any question about that? Excuse me, act as a photoautotroph, if I said that right. Uh, meaning that euglena, when there's only light around and there's only CO2 around, you can act as a photoautotroph and engage in photosynthesis to get its own energy needs and its carbon source and make its own sugar. But if glucose is around and light is around, it can act as a photoheterotroph, getting its energy needs from light and the carbon from glucose dissolved in the water. And then if there's no light around, but there's glucose around, Euglena can change its activity and act as a chemoheterotroph, getting its uh, energy source from glucose and its carbon source from glucose. And that is a complication, and that is living organisms aren't simple. They can change how they act. We can't. We're only a chemoheterotroph. But Euglena, as I mentioned, can be acting as three different ways. And then some of the chemosynthetic bacteria will use whatever is available. And they will act as a chemoautotroph if glucose is not around. But if glucose is around, they can act as a chemoheterotroph. 
Okay, any question about any of that? Have I totally confused you? No comments? So you should know what's in red here. Let me blow this up. We can classify all, all organisms by their energy source. If they get their energy need from a chemical source, we call them a chemotroph. And we can further separate the chemotrophs based on their carbon source. If they get their carbon from an organic chemical compound, they are a chemoheterotroph. If they get their carbon from CO2, then they're a chemoautotroph. If they get their energy needs from light, they are a phototroph. And if they get their carbon from an organic chemical compound like glucose, we call them a photoheterotroph. You can, uh, if they are a phototroph and they get their carbon source from CO2, they are a photoautotroph. And I mentioned that of the photoautotrophs, we have the oxygenic photoautotrophs and the inoxygenic photoautotrophs. And we're all, only going to talk about the plants and the algae and the cyanobacteria are oxygenic, but you don't need to know the oxygenic. And you can further classify the chemoheterotrophs depending on where they get their final electron acceptor. We'll talk about that in aerobic respiration. Uh, you can have uh, aerobes and the final electron acceptor is oxygen. Uh, there's the anaerobes, and their final electron acceptor is not oxygen. OK, any question about any of that? All right. You should know that nutrient molecules have energy associated with the electrons that form the chemical bonds in that molecules. In cells, energy is obtained from catabolic reactions, harvesting the energy in the bonds of the nutrients that we break down. And all of those chemical bonds have energy, and when you break that chemical bond, you can release that energy. In some reactions, in our cells only two, we can break a chemical bond and use it to make ATP. And we'll talk more about that in a later lesson. The only two reactions that our cells can engage in catabolism, breaking the molecule, and then making ATP are from aerobic respiration and fermentation. Now in green plants, they have a few other reactions where they can actually uh, make ATP, because they're more efficient at making ATP than we are. But uh, in our cells, we can only do that in two chemical reactions. That's aerobic respiration and uh, fermentation. ATP is called the energy carrier of cells because if a cell needs energy, it usually obtains that energy from ATP. ATP has a high energy bond and it's an unstable bond. When you break it, it releases a large amount of energy. And ATP will have that in the third phosphate group as well as in the second phosphate group a high energy bond. And if the cell wants that energy, it breaks off that bond, and then the energy is released, and the cell can use that energy for its energy needs. Any question about any of that? OK, can somebody confirm that you guys are there? You're so quiet. I'm... Yeah, I'm here. Okay. We're here. No questions. Right. Uh, energy production in our cells, in fact in all cells, happens from oxidation reduction reactions. These reactions are always paired. Whenever you have oxidation, you have reduction because they're paired. Oxidation is where one molecule or atom loses an electron, 
And reduction is where the other molecule or atom gains the electron. So here A loses the electron, so it is oxidized, and then B gains the electron, so it is reduced. So they're always coupled. Oxidation-reduction reactions are frequently called redox reactions, just to shorten the name. And they got that from the reverse reduction and ox for oxidation. An example is where copper plus one plus iron with three plus charge can be uh, converted into copper two plus. So copper is oxidized, it loses an electron. And then iron becomes reduced, it gains an electron. And iron go goes from three plus to two plus. An easy way to remember oxidation reduction is if you say the mnemonic uh, Leo the lion goes ger. Leo lose electrons oxidation ger gain electron reduction. Any question about any of that? In biological six systems, oxidation reduction reactions do happen with the electron, but usually proton protons are usually removed and then follow the electrons. I remember a proton is a hydrogen ion, hydrogen atom missing the electron. And so you go to the proton, the H plus plus the electron equals the hydrogen atom. And usually in biological oxidations, the hydrogen follows the electron, like right here. This molecule is going to be oxidized, losing the electron. This molecule is going to be gaining the electron reduction. It also, this one loses the hydrogen ions, and NAD plus gains the hydrogen ions. Okay, so in biological oxidations, they're often called dehydrogenations because uh, the hydrogen ion is following the electron. In reduction, the protons, the hydrogen ions, are typically also gained by the molecule that gains the electrons. And this is just something we see in biological systems. Okay. Any question about any of that? So uh, oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions happen in catabolism to extract the energy from nutrient molecules. We start with highly reduced compounds like glucose, and those molecules have many hydrogen ions, and they're degraded or catabolized to highly oxidized compounds, such as when glucose, C6H12O6, which you should learn, by the way, if you don't know, can be oxidized into CO2 and water. The energy that's released by glucose, some of it can be trapped and used to make ATP. The highly reduced compounds contain large amounts of potential energy and that potential energy is in the, stored in the chemical bonds of the molecules, such as glucose. Any question about any of that? So if not, let's discuss aerobic respiration. This is where energy conversion in a cell occurs, where a molecule will be catabolized to produce ATP. When we're working with glucose, which is the primary molecule used in aerobic respiration, it will combine with oxygen. In aerobic respiration, which is also called cellular respiration, to generate ATP, and the glucose and the oxygen will be changed into carbon dioxide and water. Any question about any of that? So the summary reaction for aerobic respiration is glucose, 6, C6H12O6, plus 
oxygen molecules, 38 aden ADP molecules, adenosine diphosphate, plus 38 uh, phosphates, that's inorganic phosphates, will be converted into six CO2 molecules, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. That's the summary reaction for aerobic respiration. You start with glucose and oxygen, and you end with carbon dioxide and water. However, uh, there's a number of steps in aerobic respiration, so this is just the summary. Any question about any of that? So in aerobic respiration, uh, redox reactions is used by the cell to make ATP, and they will start with a molecule of food, such as glucose, and break it down into CO2 and water. ATP is generated by phosphorylation of ADP. Phosphorylation is just the addition of an inorganic phosphate group to the molecule. So ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus energy, plus phosphate makes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The squiggly line in ATP, and there are two of them, is the high energy bond, which if the cell wants energy, it'll first break that bond, and if it wants more energy, it can break that bond. Any question about any of that? All right, cells have three mechanisms for making ATP. The first way a cell can make ATP is substrate level phosphorylation. That's where you have a molecule that has phosphate attached to it, and you take the phosphate off of this molecule and add it to ADP to make ATP, and you get the molecule minus the phosphate. Substrate level phosphorylation, where phosphate is moved from one molecule to ADP. This actually happens in glycolysis of aerobic respiration, and we'll look at that in just a little bit, glycolysis. Any question about any of that? The second way that cells can generate ATP is by respiration. It can also be called oxidative phosphorylation, but I won't use that term. I will always use the term respiration. Note that I'm not saying aerobic respiration, which is the way your cells can make ATP. I'm talking about all categories of respiration, both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. This involves a sequential transfer of electrons from the electron donor molecule, which is usually glucose, to the final electron acceptor, where the electrons will end up. And as the electron is donated from glucose, which isn't shown here, the electrons will flow to NADH, which will then flow to this molecule, to that molecule, to this 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 molecule and then the last molecule in our cells that the electrons will flow to is oxygen. Okay? And this sequence of electrons moving from one molecule to another happens in the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration in our cells. The energy is released in stepwise increments from glucose and that's why our cells can do this at 37 degrees. And if you don't know, you could directly harvest the energy in glucose in one step to release the energy. But that would take a blowtorch given to the glucose and then burning the glucose, converting it in one step to CO2 and water. And obviously that doesn't happen at 37 degrees. That's happening at the temperature of a blowtorch. Does anyone know the temperature of a blowtorch? 
I don't know what it is, but it's very hot. It's probably around a thousand degrees. Uh, why we do the stepwise process in uh, respiration is, is so that we can harvest that energy and make ATP and keep our cells at 37 degrees. Okay. All right. Any question about any of that? No. Uh, remember that this happens both in aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. The third way that cells can generate ATP is by photophosphorylation. This occurs only in photosynthetic cells. But remember, we're talking about bacteria in this class, and there are photosynthetic bacteria as well as photosynthetic plants. The light energy releases the electrons from chlorophyll. The light energy then can then be converted into chemical energy. And this happens by an electron transport chain. We'll show you that at the end of this lesson. ATP and NADPH are generated, but in cells, the ATP is often used to make sugar. Okay? Any question about any of that? In this photograph, you can see some photosynthetic organisms. That's why the boys are so muddy. Any question about that? That was a joke, obviously. Children are not photosynthetic. All right. Um, let's move on. The energy is released from molecules in our cells to make ATP. And it's released in controlled and controlled ways in a series of steps and it's stored by ATP. And it's not done in a single energy burst because if that happened in our cells, our cells would be too hot and they'd die. The electrons are passed from donor molecules like glucose, and they're passed from one compound to another through a series of redox reactions. And that happens in the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration which we'll look at in a little bit. All right, so we're going to talk about how our cells can make ATP, and it's from carbohydrate catabolism. Many cells can generate ATP from carbohydrate catabolism. Even green plants can generate ATP from carbohydrate catabolism. When the green plant doesn't have light, and it has energy needs, it will engage in carbohydrate catabolism for its energy needs. And that's what green plants do at night. And then if you're in, what is it, Barrow, Fort, is it Fort Barrow, Point Barrow, something like that, in very northern part of Alaska. Uh, in the wintertime, the, uh, the night is like three months, and the green plants survive from getting their energy needs from carbohydrate catabolism in the winter. Uh, the most common energy source for carbohydrate catabolism is glucose, but glucose is not the only molecule that may be used. Other carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins can be used. For most people, we will break those molecules down and convert them into glucose and then send glucose through aerobic respiration. But as I mentioned with the marathon runners, after 45 minutes into their run, they can directly metabolize lipids by aerobic respiration. And somebody will have to look up, how are proteins used in aerobic respiration? And I don't know the answer to that. That's why I said somebody should look it up. I'll give you an extra credit point if you tell the class. All right. To produce energy from glucose, microorganisms use two general processes.
they engage in carbohydrate catabolism, but there are two ways to do it. There's respiration. It's one way you can metabolize the glucose. The other way is by fermentation. And when we're talking about respiration, you should realize that cells can do it in two ways. There's aerobic respiration, which our cells engage in, and there's anaerobic respiration, which anaerobes engage in. Any question about any of that? Here's a question for you. Our cells, or at least some of our cells, can engage in more ways than aerobic respiration to make the cell. And these cells can engage in fermentation. What cells of ours can engage in fermentation to make? Wall Street using index features and go short. What cells can uh, make, uh, use fermentation to make ATP? What cells of yours can make ATP using fermentation? Our muscle cells? Yes, our muscle cells can make ATP by using fermentation. Very good. Here's a little movie going over resp aerobic respiration. Can you guys hear that? All cells need energy to stay alive. Usually your cells get their energy through the process called aerobic respiration. The word aerobic refers to oxygen. In aerobic respiration, oxygen interacts chemically with a molecule of glucose. The glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. This process releases energy, which the cell stores in the chemical bonds of ATP. The first stage of aerobic respiration, glycolysis, occurs in the cytosol, the jelly-like part of the cytoplasm. Glycolysis breaks each molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, energizes two electron carrier molecules, and produces two molecules of ATP. The next two stages of aerobic respiration are carried out in the mitochondria. Pyruvate enters a mitochondrion. Once inside, it is modified and enters the Krebs cycle. The reactions of the Krebs cycle break the pyruvate molecules down to carbon dioxide, create two more molecules of ATP, and energize more electron carrier molecules. The final stage of aerobic respiration is electron transport. The electron carrier molecules that were energized in the earlier stages deliver electrons and hydrogen ions to the electron transport chain. As the electrons are passed down the chain, energy is released and used to make ATP. This final stage produces as many as 32 molecules of ATP from each molecule of glucose. All right, any questions about any of that? So that was a little summary of aerobic respiration. Here we're looking at the summary of aerobic respiration. It has three principal steps, the first being glycolysis, the second being the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, the third being the electron transport chain, sometimes called ETC, and it has like four different other names. Electron transfer chain is one of them, uh, electron transport, phosphorylation is another. Uh, all of those are similar. It's also called oxidative phosphorylation or something like that. 
uh, which I won't use because that term is not similar enough to electron transport chain. Your textbook mostly calls it the electron transport chain, and I will use that term as well. Okay? I should mention the Krebs cycle has another name, and generally I call it the Krebs cycle. Any question about any of that? All right, in aerobic respiration, essentially the electrons flow from glucose, a high energy rich molecule, and that is converted to CO2 and water, which are energy poor molecules. The energy in glucose, some of it can be used to uh, make ATP. And in aerobic respiration, the yield of ATP is high. Our cells, at least our muscle cells and other cells, can also make ATP from glucose using fermentation. Fermentation does have glycolysis, but it does not have the Krebs cycle and it does not have the electron transfer chain. Instead of glucose being converted to CO2 in water, glucose is converted to pyruvate in glycolysis. And then the pyruvate is converted to the end product of the fermentation, which could be ethanol or lactic, lactate, depending on what fermentation reaction we're talking about. Uh, the ATP production from fermentation is much lower than from aerobic respiration, and you will learn that you only get two ATP from fermentation. Any question about the overview? another picture of an overview of uh, aerobic respiration. So here in pink would be a cell of a eukaryote. And glycolysis, or the breaking down of glucose to pyruvate, occurs in the cytoplasm of a eukaryotic cell. Some ATP is made, NADH is made, I'll talk more about NADH in a minute. And then the pyruvate moves into the mitochondria, where in the matrix of the mitochondria, uh, the preparatory step and the, the Krebs cycle occur. Uh, the Krebs cycle has a different name in this picture. It's called the citric acid cycle, but that is the Krebs cycle, where more NADH is made and more ATP is made. The NADH and all the FADH2 from the Krebs cycle as well as the NADH from glycolysis, carry the electrons to the electron transport chain, which is stated right there. It's also called oxidative phosphorylation. I'm not going to call it oxidative phosphorylation because that term is too far different from the electron transport chain. It can also be uh, called chemo chemoosmosis. I won't use that term as well. Okay. Uh, the electron transport chain happens on the across and on the inner mitochondrial wall of the mitochondria of a eukaryotic cell. And ATP is made in the electron transport chain. Any question about any of that? So if not, let's move on to glycolysis, the first step of aerobic respiration. Glycolysis does have another name, the emden merhorf pathway. I don't ever call it that. For one thing, I have a hard time pronouncing the names. But uh, uh, I will call it glycolysis. In glycolysis, uh, glucose is oxidized to form pyruvic acid. Glycolysis can occur in most living cells. Glycolysis can occur in, in the presence or the absence of oxygen. Glycolysis does not need oxygen. ATP and NADH are made by glycolysis, but not a whole lot. Any question about any of that? So here we're looking at the steps of glycolysis. And when I was an undergraduate, not only did I have to know the names of each intermediate molecule, from glucose to 
pyruvic acid, we had to know the names of all the enzymes making each chemical reaction. And I think I was required to know that as an undergraduate. So I think it's fair that you're required to know that as an undergraduate. What do you guys think? Terrible idea. Terrible no thanks. Idea. Let's not do that. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, it's nine or 10 steps, depending on how you count it. Nine or 10 enzymes. Uh, ATP is used in glycolysis, but we generate more ATP. And in the steps of glycolysis, oh, let's just go to the show. You do need to know the summary. You start with glucose. You should know it takes in ATP, but you get out ATP. You do get out NADH. And you get out ATP. So glycolysis, you gain two ATP. The glucose, one glucose molecule is split into two, and that's two pyruvates. Let me show you that. Glucose has six carbon. Why are they six balls for one carbon? And it's converted into two pyruvates. One is right here, which is converted into that and then sent through. So you get two pyruvates out of that. And that's the six carbons of glucose. Uh, we also gain two NADH from glycolysis. So you start with glucose and you gain what's in the red box. You should know the red box and then you start with glucose. So I'm requiring that. Anything else about glycolysis you need to know? All right. So um, remember, there are two types of respiration. Aerobic respiration, which our cells engage in. And there the electron flows to oxygen. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration. But in respiration, there's other types, which are anaerobic respiration. And in the anaerobes, the electrons do not flow to oxygen. The final electron acceptor is another molecule other than oxygen. It could be my a nitrogen compound like nitrite or nitrate or a sulfur compound or an iron compound. It can be many different things depending on the uh, anaerobe. The important thing to know is in respiration ATP is generated. So the pyruvic acid made by glycolysis uh, will be used by the Krebs cycle, but the Krebs cycle cannot directly take the pyruvic acid. So we have one step, the preparatory step, where the pyruvic acid is converted into acetylcoenzyme A. One CO2 is given off, acetylcoenzyme A is two carbons, pyruvic acid is three carbons. So this is the first burning of the atoms of glucose into CO2. And then one NADH is generated by the preparatory step. Uh, Acetylcoenzyme A can then enter the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. And both of them are abbreviated TCA, TCA. I won't use these terms, but some authors do. I will always call it the Krebs cycle after the doctor who discovered it. Uh, called tricarboxylic acid because it involves a lot of tricarboxylic acids. It's called the citric acid cycle because in the first part of the cycle, the first molecule that's made is citric acid. Uh, here we're looking at the preparatory step right here, which I've already discussed, and the Krebs cycle. Let me blow this up. 
As I mentioned, acetylcoenzyme A can directly enter the Krebs cycle. The acetylcoenzyme A combines with oxaloacetic acid to make citric acid. You don't need to know that. The citric acid is then converted to this molecule, converted to that 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 molecule, and then ends up with oxaloacetic acid. So we end where we started, and that's why it is a cycle. Okay? As long as you have uh, acetylcoenzyme A coming in, the Krebs cycle, come on mouse, will keep running. In the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle, we do generate ATP right here. Whoops, can't show it now. Right in this step here. We do enter, uh, generate four NADH, uh, one in the preparatory step, one right here, one here, and then one here. And we do generate one FADH2 molecule right here. And then uh, of the pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon molecule, each of them are burned into CO2. And there's one CO2 here, one here, and one here for each of the carbons in pyruvic acid. Uh, we'll talk about NADH and FADH2. We're going to carry the electrons to the electron transport chain, which is the next step in aerobic respiration, which we'll talk about shortly. And remember, this is a cycle because you end up where you started. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Hmm, it's escaping me. Oh, yeah. Um, how many times do the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle run per molecule of glucose? How many times does the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle run per molecule of glucose? 30 times? Yes. Anybody else? Nobody's going to take a guess. Uh, in, the, uh, in the in uh, the glycolysis, glucose is converted to two pyruvic acids. So the the uh, preparatory step and the Krebs cycle will run two times per molecule of glucose. Because from glucose we generate two pyruvic acids in glycolysis. Everybody got that? So for a molecule of glucose we generate two ATP, eight NADH, two FADH2, and six CO2 because we have to double these numbers because there will be two pyruvic acids being made from glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, you do remember we discussed <laughs> the preparatory step and right here, come on, move. Why is that not moving? I don't understand why they didn't go. much longer and I can't do it. From glycolysis, we start with glucose, we end up with two uh, pyruvates, which you can't see that very well. There are two pyruvates, two right there. Any question about that? Now I gotta go back. Let's see if that's gonna work. It does go forward that way. It didn't go backwards though. Nope, that didn't go work. Ah! All right. So we're here, and we did mention that here is the overview what the NADH and the FADH2 do is they carry the electrons from glycolysis and the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, carrying the electrons to the electron transport chain.
Any question about that? The electron transport chain is a series of carrier molecules that are in turn reduced and oxidized as electrons flow from glucose to these molecules and they'll be passed down the chain of the molecules in the electron transport chain. Energy will be released from the electrons and each time the electron is transferred from one molecule to another some energy is released. The energy is released and can be used by chemoosmosis to produce ATP. Any question about any of that? We have another hyperlink. Let me get it to run. I had it really up high for the last one because it's so quiet. The electron transport chain is a series of protein complexes embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. Electrons captured from donor molecules are transferred through these complexes. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of hydrogen ions. This pumping generates the gradient used by the ATP synthase complex to synthesize ATP. The following complexes are found in the electron transport chain. NADH dehydrogenase, cytochrome BC1, cytochrome oxidase, and the complex that makes ATP, ATP synthase. In addition to these complexes, two mobile carriers are also involved, ubiquinone and cytochrome C. Other key components in this process are NADH and the electrons from it, hydrogen ions, molecular oxygen, water, and ADP and PI, which combine to form ATP. At the start of the electron transport chain, Two electrons are passed from NADH into the NADH dehydrogenase complex. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of one hydrogen ion for each electron. Next, the two electrons are transferred to ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is called a mobile transfer molecule because it moves the electrons to the cytochrome BC1 complex. Each electron is then passed from the cytochrome BC1 complex to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C accepts each electron one at a time. One hydrogen ion is pumped through the complex as each electron is transferred. The next major step occurs in the cytochrome oxidase complex. This step requires four electrons. These four electrons interact with a molecular oxygen molecule and eight hydrogen ions. The four electrons, four of the hydrogen ions, and the molecular oxygen are used to form two water molecules. The other four hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. This series of hydrogen pumping steps creates a gradient. The potential energy in this gradient is used by ATP synthase to make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ATP synthesis steps you see here are discussed in greater detail in the ATP synthase gradients animation. This animation illustrates two full cycles of electron donation. In biological systems, however, many electron transport cycles occur simultaneously, helping to ensure that the proton gradient is always maintained. All right, any questions about that? Uh, the electron transport chain is a 
chain of <coughs> molecules in a membrane and the electrons move from one molecule to another. That's why it's called the electron transport chain. Any questions about that part? So here we see the electron transport chain. Let me see if I can blow that up. It is a bunch of molecules in, or proteins actually, in the, uh, the membrane. And NADH and FADH2 bring the electrons to these molecules. And as the electrons move through these molecules, transported from one molecule to the next, uh, the energy in the electron is used by some of the molecules, some of the proteins, to pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And that happens here, here, and here. The electron then will leave the last protein in the chain of proteins and the electron in aerobic respiration will go to oxygen combined with hydrogen and oxygen and form water. So we say oxygen is the final electron acceptor because it's accepting the electrons that initially came from glucose. It came from glucose, we carried by NADH to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, and then flow to oxygen. And that's why we call these aerobes, because they have the electrons flowing at the end to oxygen. Any question about that? This is what happens to the oxygen when you breathe it in. The oxygen you breathe in will in aerobic respiration combine with electrons and hydrogen and be converted to water. Some of that water is breathed out, some of it the body can recycle. None of the oxygen you breathe in is converted to CO2. Any question about any of that? All right. Well, we mentioned that uh, the molecules, this one, that one, and that one, when the electron is flowing through the protein, it gives the protein the energy it needs to pump hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. That creates a two-fold gradient. There's more hydrogen on this side of the membrane than on this side, and there's also more positive charges on this side than on this side. That is creating a potential energy difference where the hydrogen and the positive charges want to flow from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. And they just want to do that by diffusion. However, they cannot move across the membrane bilayer. They can only move through the membrane bilayer at this protein or this channel, whatever you want to call it, protein channel. And this protein channel is an ATP synthase. As the hydrogen ions move through the protein, it gives the protein the energy it needs to phosphorylate ADP and convert the ADP into ATP. And that's how cells make the majority of their ATP, at least if they're engaging in aerobic respiration. Any question about any of that? All right, the ATP molecules that are produced by uh, the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration. For eukaryotes, the electron transport chain can generate 32 to 34 
ATP. For prokaryotes, they're a little more efficient. They can generate 34 ATP. Now for most of the cells in your body, they can only generate 32 ATP per molecule of glucose. That would be like your brain cells, and your nose cell, and your skin cells, your muscle cells. But there are three cells in your body which can generate 34 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. And those are your heart cells, your liver cells, and your kidney cells. Why do you think your heart cells, your kidney cells, and your liver cells generate more ATP than, let's say, your brain cells or your skin cells? What's different between the heart and your brain, for example? The heart's constantly working. Your heart is constantly working, always spending energy. The same is true of the kidneys. They're constantly purifying the blood, so they're always working. And then the liver is either filtering the blood or adding things to the blood or removing things from the blood. The point is the liver is constantly working. And so these cells are a little more efficient and they generate 34 ATP per molecule of glucose. Whereas the cells don't, don't always work in your body, like your skin cells or your brain cells, only generate 32 ATP. And uh, just to put it in there that uh, I'm, I'm teasing you about your brain, but uh, human brains, uh, we only use the human brain specifically, uh, 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 a, a low amount of percentage, I don't remember, it's 10 or 12% of the time. The majority of the time, we don't actually actively use our brain. But our heart is always pumping, at least until you die. Your heart is always working. You do have a resting between the beating, but it's always pumping. All right. I think that's it. Um, the prokaryote cells are more efficient. Like I said, they generate 34 ATP per molecule of glucose. Uh, this is showing you the overview. Uh, and this is showing you the overview of the electron transport chain looking at NADH and FADH2, bringing the electrons to the molecules in the electron transport chain. You don't need to know any of the names of the molecules in the electron transport chain. Uh, the video, I think, told you some of them, but we're not going to discuss them. And for us, the electrons will flow to oxygen. If we're an aerobe, and the oxygen will be converted to water. Uh, the flow of electrons happens by oxidation and reduction. So let me see, the electron leaves NADH, so that's the loss of electron oxidation. FMN gains the electron, so it's reduced, and then it'll give the electron down the chain, so it'll be oxidized. Uh, this is an important slide showing you the overview of aerobic respiration and uh, uh, the electron transport chain portion of it. So the NADH and the FADH2, which isn't shown here, giving it to here, uh, generate or donate the electron to the proteins here, which are proteins in a membrane of the cell. That's why we call it the electron transfer chain. There are proteins lined up in a chain. Uh, that membrane for eukaryotic cells is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This membrane here, let me blow the 
And that's where the electron transport chain is occurring on the inner mitochondrial membrane, either across it or in the membrane. For prokaryotic cells, they don't have a mitochondria. And where this electron transport chain is happening is it's happening across and in the cell membrane. Now for eukaryotes, where we're pumping the hydrogen ions is between the space between the inner mitochondrial membrane and the outer mitochondrial membrane. And that outer membrane is helping to protect the cell from the hydrogen ions. And as you know, eukaryotes have things nice and compartmentalized, and so this is a nice compartment to pump the hydrogen ions into the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. In the prokaryotic cells, where are the hydrogen ions being pumped? If this is the cell membrane, where are these hydrogen ions being pumped? What's outside the cell membrane of a prokaryotic cell? Well, you guys really don't like answering. What's outside the cell membrane of a prokaryotic cell? The environment? Yeah, it's the environment, but there's something specifically outside the cell membrane that we find in a cell. And what is that called? Somebody just said it. The cell wall is, I think, what you're trying to say. It's just that it's not coming across very clear. Uh, yes, the uh, prokaryotic cell is pumping these hydrogen ions into the cell wall. And then the hydrogen ions are coming back across the cell membrane of a prokaryotic cell by this protein channel right there. All right, any question about any of that? I've already talked about that. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned, yes, I did. I did mention that the gradient of hydrogen ion causes a two-fold gradient. You have both more hydrogen over here on this side than that side. And you have more positive charges there than that side. And that makes a potential energy difference between this side of the membrane and that side. And the cell uses that potential energy difference to make ATP. Uh, that is called chemiosmosis, a term I don't use, where the hydrogen ions flow from this side of the membrane to that side to make ATP. And the electron transport chain is sometimes called oxidative phosphorylation. I will never call it that, and I won't require you to know this. I'm just pointing it out that some authors use that term instead of the electron transport chain. But this is where the synthesis of ATP happens in aerobic respiration. And that's where the majority of the ATP is made if you remember from the slide earlier, the electron transport chain in eukaryotes makes 32 to 34, in prokaryotes 34 ATP. When we look at the total amount of ATP made by aerobic respiration, the vast majority of it happens in the electron transport chain. For eukaryotes, not eukaryotes, yeah, for eukaryotes, sorry, I'm losing it, uh, they generate 36 to 38 ATP per molecule of glucose. For prokaryotes, they're a little more efficient. In all of respiration, they generate 38 ATP. So let's talk about it with prokaryotes. Uh, two ATP are made by glycolysis. Two are made by the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle. And then 34 ATP are made by the electron transport chain. 
You should know the summary equation for aerobic respiration. Glucose, C6H12O6, plus six oxygen molecules, with 38 ADP and 38 phosphate groups are converted into CO2, six CO2s, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. And if we look at where the oxygen and water came from, all of these oxygens came from oxygen. None of them came, the oxygen and water, came from um, the oxygen and glucose. All of the carbon and oxygen and glucose are converted into CO2. And we generate 38 ATP. All right, are there any questions about any of that? Seems like I forgot to mention something. Hopefully it occurred to me. So this is showing you the numbers for aerobic respiration in prokaryotes, a summary. You should know when ATP is made uh, and how much of each step of aerobic respiration. You probably should know, yeah, I did say that, when ATP is made. All right, any questions about aerobic respiration? Let me see if I can remember what I wanted to say. escaped me. I had it for a while and now I've lost it. All right, aerobic respiration happens in aerobes where the electron flows to oxygen. There's also anaerobic respiration and this happens with anaerobes where the final electron acceptor is not oxygen. It's an inorganic molecule like nitrite or nitrate or sulfate or an iron molecule. And it depends on what anaerobe we're talking about, what form of anaerobic respiration it's using. In the anaerobes or anaerobic respiration, they do have glycolysis in the Krebs cycle and the preparatory step. So all that's the same. And they do have an electron transport chain, but the electron transport chain is modified in anaerobic respiration. Generally, the electron transport chain is shorter, and then the electrons do not flow to oxygen. They flow to some other molecule. Because the electron transport chain is shorter in anaerobic respiration, they generate less ATP than the aerobes. And it can vary how much ATP they generate depending on the form of anaerobic respiration. Some of them generate between two, a little bit more than two ATP per molecule of glucose. And then the best anaerobes can generate 36 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. But the anaerobes can never generate as much ATP as the aerobes. So the aerobes are the most efficient in generating ATP. And that reminds me what I was trying to talk about with aerobic respiration. The efficiency of converting glucose, the energy in glucose, to the energy in ATP is about 40%, meaning 40% of the energy in glucose can be converted into the energy in ATP. 
you might say, geez, 40%, that's not very efficient. This is about as efficient as humans have ever seen. Like, for example, the efficiency of the best car engine that you normally run on a road would be converting the energy in gasoline to the energy in moving the car would be t around 20 percent. And the very best motor, which we would never use in a car, it's a, uh, what do you call that, a, a um, prototype, a little plastic car that is only driven someplace safe and they, they made it to test the engine. The best engine they've ever built, the efficiency is only 25 percent able to convert 25% of the energy into what we want, which for a car would make it move, okay? So the cell of generating 40% is very efficient. Any question about any of that? Uh, because anaerobes do not generate as much ATP per molecule of glucose as aerobes, anaerobes tend to grow slower than aerobes. Any question about that? Anaerobes will grow slower than aerobes. Because anaer aerobic respiration is the most efficient. All right, so there we've talked about respiration involving three steps, glycolysis, the uh, preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. And you see all of these three steps in both aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Let's talk briefly about fermentation, which is another form of carbohydrate catabolism breaking down glucose to generate ATP. And your muscle cells can, can engage in uh, fermentation as well as in aerobic respiration. So uh, fermentation releases the energy from oxidation of organic molecules like glucose via glycolysis and glycolysis is the only part of fermentation that produces ATP. As we previously discussed, glycolysis generates two ATP per molecule of glucose. Glycolysis takes glucose and converts it into pyruvic acid we do generate two ATP, and then NAD plus is converted to NADH. Fermentation does not use the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. It only uses glycolysis, and then after glycolysis, we have one or two fermentation steps where pyruvic acid is converted into the end product of fermentation. And that end product will differ depending on which fermentation reaction we're talking about. The final electron acceptor in this case is the pyruvic acid that accepts the electron that flowed from glucose it's carried by NADH, and that will convert the pyruvic acid into the end product of fermentation. Okay, so in this case, uh, an organic molecule, pyruvic acid, is the final electron acceptor, accepting the electrons from glucose. Here's a question for you. We're taking the NADH in fermentation and converting it into NAD+. Why would your muscle cells do that? 
because you're only going to generate from fermentation 2 ATP per molecule of glucose. And if you simply wait it around, your muscle will eventually get oxygen. And then the NADH could be sent to the electron transport chain, and you'll generate much more ATP from NADH that way than you will from a fermentation reaction where actually the NADH is used and you don't get any ATP out of it. So why do your muscle cells use up the NADH in fermentation instead of keep the NADH around to later be used in, a, in a aerobic respiration? Come on, somebody guess. It's Is shown. it because uh, there's no oxygen available to receive that end product? Uh, it's true. That's why the muscle cells are engaging in fermentation and there's no oxygen. But let's say the, the cell were to just keep this NADH around, not use it up in fermentation. Eventually, oxygen will flow to the muscle. And then the NADH can be used in uh, aerobic respiration and you'd make more ATP if you kept the NADH around waiting for oxygen to return and then engage in aerobic respiration because as I said the NADH is being used up here and we're not getting any ATP out of it so why is the muscle cell using up the NADH here? Is there also produced lactate? Yeah, it's producing the lactate. That is true. And uh, let me show you that since you brought it up. Uh, our muscle cells only engage in lactic acid fermentation where pyruvic acid is converted in one step to lactic acid. And the NADH is used up to convert the pyruvic acid to lactic acid. Okay. But my question is, why does the cell use up the NADH? Why doesn't it just keep the NADH around and wait until oxygen returns and then use that NADH in aerobic respiration? Because it can get ATP out of that. Is it just because it's a quicker process? Well, that's true. It is quicker in that the cell wants ATP. That's why it's engaging in fermentation. If it wasn't a muscle cell that's not acting, it won't engage in fermentation. Okay. Is it because the NADH, they're high energy bonds, so they're more unstable, so that molecule will just dissociate by itself without uh, being fermented? Uh, no, that's not really it there. It's because the cell needs more NAD plus to engage in glycolysis. If there's no more NADA, NAD plus uh, available, glycolysis will not run. Okay? And the cell wants glycolysis to run to generate ATP in fermentation when there's no oxygen around. And you see this all the time whenever you're running or something and your muscle starts burning. It's because your muscles are using ATP faster than aerobic respiration can make ATP and the oxygen gets used up and the heart and the lungs are working like mad but they can't get the muscle enough oxygen and so the muscle will engage in fermentation take glucose convert it into pyruvic acid to make ATP and then take the pyruvic acid and make lactic acid and you need to use up the NADH to make NAD plus. Otherwise, there will not be any NAD plus. And then you can't have uh, glycolysis proceeding. So that's why the NADH is used up. You need to recycle it so that you can continue to uh, engage in glycolysis. And your muscles want to engage in fermentation when there's not oxygen around so that they can have some ATP to continue working. 
And what happens to the muscles when ATP isn't there? You actually usually see it one time in the Olympics. I'm not sure if it's happened this time in the Olympics or not. I only watched early on in the Olympics. But usually one athlete will, uh, in fermentation, use up all of the glucose in their cells and then there's no more glucose so they can't engage in glycolysis and fermentation they stop making ATP and they just collapse in the summer I think the coach runs out and sprays them down with water just to cool them down and then the Olympic athlete gets up and walks across the finish line because they're okay the heart and the lungs are working like mad to get oxygen to the muscle cells and uh, glucose will come to the muscles with the blood flow, flow also. And so the cells will eventually begin aerobic respiration and the athlete will get up and walk across the finish line as they get ATP made from aerobic respiration. But while they're running or whatever to cross the finish line, uh, they're engaging in fermentation because their muscles can't get enough oxygen to perform aerobic respiration, so they fall back on fermentation. As long as there's glucose around, they can engage in fermentation. But if they use up all that glucose, they collapse because there's no more ATP. Their muscles stop functioning. All right. Has that happened? In I have another question. Okay. So you're saying that the the reaction is kind of limited with the amount of glucose, but what if there's just too much lactic acid buildup and the, all the acid is denaturing, you know, these proteins that we're, we're needed for this process? Uh, I don't think that can happen in our muscle cells. We have pH buffers in the tissues, and that'll buffer the pH. But you're right, when the cell gets lots of lactic acid, you'll fern, feel the burn in your muscle and that's from the lactic acid okay but i don't think we can get too much lactic acid i'm not positive but i don't think we can we just <laughs> can't do it uh meaning the ph will uh, become acidic but we have buffers in our cells that can control the pH, and that'll keep it the uh, muscles from denaturing. Okay. I suppose if you get too much lactic acid in your muscles, you're not going to be running as fast, and uh, your muscles will start to freeze, and that'll slow down your fermentation. And the heart and the lungs are always working like mad to get oxygen in there. And they will start uh, changing the lactic acid into CO2 and water. Uh, if you don't know, the lactic acid will, with time, be converted back into, I think, pyruvate, and then sent through um, uh, aerobic respiration in the normal way. Anyways, that's what our muscle cells can do. They can perform lactic acid fermentation uh, with that um, pyruvic acid is just converted into two there's two pyruvics two, two pyruvic acids from glycolysis from glucose and they'll be converted into two lactic acids uh, a lot of other organisms can engage in lactic acid fermentation like the organisms which make uh, um, ye uh, not yeast, <laughs> yogurt, uh, sauerkraut, uh, chocolate, uh, most cheeses like cheddar cheese engage in lactic acid fermentation. So a lot of our fermented foods have an organism engaging in lactic acid fermentation. There are other types of fermentation, which none of our cells can engage in, but yeast can engage in ethanolic or alcoholic fermentation, 
converting glucose into ethanol and CO2 uh, and actually yeast in the making of bread uh, makes ethanol and CO2. The ethanol is low with yeast added to bread but the CO2 is what gives the bread the leavening. Uh, but if you use sourdough cultures you can taste the ethanol in the uh, sourdough bread. Okay, It'll actually evaporate when the bread is cooked, but if you were to eat the dough raw, you could taste the alcohol. Um, there's another type, you don't need to know the name of the bacteria, engaging in uh, proponic acid fermentation. And this happens, do I have that shown here? Not in this slide. Uh, this happens in Swiss cheese, where the bacteria make proponic acid and they make CO2 as well. And that's why Swiss cheese has holes in it from the carbon dioxide that's made in the fermentation step. But as far as I know, Swiss cheese is the only cheese made by this fermentation reaction. Most of the other cheeses are made by lactic acid fermentation. And then there are other fermentation reactions, three others shown here. Uh, let me talk about one of them. I'm not seeing it now. Now let's go to the next slide and we'll show it. There is a fermentation uh, reaction that makes acetic acid and that's how vinegar gets made. The wine, or the ethanol in the wine, is converted to vinegar and that would be like red wine vinegar. That's how we make vinegar uh, from fermentation. Um, there are a few other fermentation reactions, but we're not going to talk about them. They're used in industry to make specific products, like uh, making glycerol or acetone and butanol. We can use a fermentation reaction to make those. Okay? All right, any question about any of that? Most of the fermented food that you eat, it's made using lactic acid fermentation, which is also the fermentation your muscle cells can engage in. The only exception that I'm aware of is uh, Swiss cheese. is a fermented food that does not use lactic acid fermentation. All right, any other questions? Oh, here's one. I didn't know they made vitamin C from uh, fermentation. No, sorry, that's what they use as the commercial use. It's to make sorbos. Um, all right, any questions about fermentation? If not, let's take a look at a little summary here. Uh, aerobic respiration, uh, the final electron acceptor is oxygen, the uh, ATP production is 36 to 38 ATPs, anaerobic respiration is a variable number but it's fewer than 38 and it's some number between 2 and 36 ATP. And then fermentation, you only generate uh, two ATP molecules. All right, any question about any of that? If not, nobody uh, told me that uh, we're past our time. So let's end this here. And uh, we'll start at the lab at uh, 7.20, okay? All right.